Good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining our second Enclave webinar on managing lung cancer patients through the COVID-19 pandemic, What to Know. I'm your moderator again this evening, Gina Columbus. I'm editorial director for Enclave and I'm very happy to be with all of you again. The mission of this webinar is to provide our listeners with a free form discussion on how you and your colleagues are managing your patients with lung cancer during the COVID-19 pandemic. We will cover a list of topics that each faculty member will go into greater detail on and share insights from the front lines. So as you can see from the slide, we will be discussing topics centered around best practices before patients come to clinic, the incorporation of telehealth visits, dedicated infected versus clean centers, the impact on molecular testing, clinical trial enrollment, delays in treatment, and a case-based discussion to identify COVID-19 pneumonitis from immune-related pneumonitis. And a couple of quick housekeeping notes. We encourage you to submit any questions you have, and we will try to answer as many of them as we can during the QA portion of this webinar. And also to expand your video player to full screen, just click on the icon on the lower right of the player, hit escape on your keyboard to revert back to the smaller player. So we have a distinguished panel of experts on today's presentation, and I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves and give their title and affiliation. Dr. Agarwal. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Charu Agarwal. I'm the Leslie M. Heisler Assistant Professor for Lung Cancer Excellence at the Abramson Cancer Center and the University of Pennsylvania. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Dr. West. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Jack West. I'm an associate clinical professor in medical oncology at the City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center in the Los Angeles area. And I'm also the uh, executive director of Access Hope, which is our remote consult service. Thank you. Dr. Pinnell. Hi, uh, my name is Nate Pinnell. I am a thoracic medical oncologist and associate professor of medicine and I direct the Lung Cancer Medical Oncology Program at the Cleveland Clinic Towson Cancer Institute in Cleveland. Thank you, and Dr. Liu. I am uh, Stephen Liu. I'm a medical oncologist and director of thoracic oncology at the Georgetown University and the Lombardi Comprehensive Cancer Center in Washington, DC. Great, thank you everyone. As mentioned, uh, this is the second webinar in a planned series. So anything that's not covered during this discussion, discussion we can certainly raise in subsequent webcasts. So we have a great deal of material to cover again tonight, so let's begin. Uh, I'm just gonna start us off quickly with some very quick numbers on the current state of COVID-19. So as of today, the number of global confirmed COVID-19 cases are 823,626. The United States has 186,101 confirmed cases with 3,603 deaths. Most recently, on March 29th, President Donald Trump extended the nationwide social distancing guidelines for another 30 days, bringing us to April 30th. So the 15-day guidelines were set to expire actually this past Monday. However, as we've discussed previously, the social distancing guidelines are much more difficult to adhere for patients with serious medical conditions that require urgent attention. Last week, we discussed how COVID-19 has truly impacted everything, including how we manage lung cancer, in our patients, and we'll be hitting on some other impactful topics in this space tonight. So with that, I would like to turn it toward one of the first topics of discussion. What are some of your best practices before patients come to clinic? And let's also incorporate some of these telehealth visits and some of the dedicated infected versus clean centers. Let's start with Dr. West. Well, I would say that uh, one of the first questions is uh, asking whether uh, the patients who are potentially going to be on your schedule uh, need to be seen uh, in at this time or whether that visit is reasonable to push out to a longer interval, particularly when we're talking about patients who are uh, just to be getting a repeat scan and labs while on an ongoing, say, oral therapy that they've done well on for a long time. So the first issue is just reviewing that schedule to see whether that patient needs to be evaluated at a given uh, clinic or not. And then second, whether a patient is a good candidate to evaluate a phone visit, a telehealth 
or because they are getting and or need to be evaluated due to significant changes uh, should be in to your actual, uh, clinic. Uh, one of the other things that, that many of our centers have varying and still evolving practices for is how restricted to be patients are coming in onto the campus to, to get evaluated in our clinics. Uh, we have initiated a very limited number of entry points, normal scanning and uh, a brief series of questions just to screen patients for what they appear to be at higher risk for, uh, for coronavirus. And, uh, and various centers are coming increasingly online for uh, broader testing of people who may be at greater risk. Uh, but we have now initiated a policy of hope, both for inpatient and outpatient, uh, that is uh, exclude visitors, which is a challenge we recognize for uh, people coming into the clinic and also particularly for inpatient. We have quite a few patients who are receiving stem cell transplants, CAR T and for proliates. And so it is a hardship we take very seriously about restricting visitors, but we're also very concerned. We all need to take very seriously the risk of, uh, of exposures and spread. So uh, that, that is a, a current reality uh, where we are. It was just recently introduced. It is something that our patients, families, and, and others are, are uh, having to accommodate, though really, understand the rationale. It is a challenge and I think different centers uh, have, have varying policies on this. Uh, beyond that, I would say that the, uh, the other issues that we're dealing with is isolated. Infection or known to have infection and, and at the places that have had a higher uh, volume of folks uh, that really mean isolating uh, full wards or or large areas of the hospital to uh, ensure that that there is no increased risk of cross contamination of those with infection to others who are at the same center and at the places that have highest volumes whether that is in Italy or Spain or also now in New York essentially entire centers that are becoming uh, dedicated to caring for patients with coronavirus and, and COVID-19. Uh, Actually, the, I, I wonder this thing, coronavirus is the, the infection without necessarily symptoms of from, but with symptoms, uh, that's when it becomes COVID-19. But uh, so anyway, I, I would say one important point is this is changing for us. Uh, I'm afraid that we're going to look at the numbers that you introduce each weekly, uh, each weekly webinar in, and if we graph that, it's going to be pretty sobering to think back wistfully when it was only the volumes we're talking about now when we look three or four weeks hence. And within the weeks, I think our, our coping mechanisms, our policies, everything we learn about this is likely to change just over the course of this series. Thank you, Dr. West. Would any of the other faculty like to expand on some of these points? Yeah, I think that at uh, Georgetown, we've taken similar effects and you know, all of us work at pretty busy cancer centers. Um, and I think what we've noticed over the past week is that they are dramatically different, that the traffic has decreased. And I don't mean the road traffic, we're used to having sort of different vendors, representatives, a lot of visitors, and, and we just don't have that anymore. We're trying to minimize traffic, minimize exposure. And I think every step that we can do counts. And so every exposure that we can take away, we want to take away. And we, we think that's the safest approach right now. So I would add that, um, you know, we are moving um, more and more to telehealth visits. You know, we've increased our screening. Um, so there's actually a pool of nurses that uh, call patients uh, before they're even destined to come into the cancer center and go through the screening questionnaires. And then thermal scanners have been introduced, not just for physicians and nurses and healthcare workers, um, 
but also for patients, which has greatly enhanced, um, sort of at least added another layer uh, of protection, both to patients and other individuals from exposure. And, um, you know, even for our patients that are getting treatment, we are uh, using and utilizing telehealth visits as much as possible so that we can minimize uh, the interaction with even our front desk staff, uh, our MAs who room these patients and um, all of that, the vitals can be done in the infusion room Room and that has made dr drastic uh, reductions in the amount of foot traffic, as Stephen was saying, uh, into the clinic itself. Um, but I, I do think um, that it raises the question of what we do with patients who may be asymptomatic carriers or even, you know, providers that may be asymptomatic carriers. And I think something that we are all grappling with and um, the question of universal masks comes up and um, this is not uniformly adapted, uh, but our, at our center, for example, we are uh, masking, um, you know, not with N95s for sure, but um, with regular surgical masks to at least minimize um, transmission. Yeah, I and uh, I agree. I, one of the things that I think will be interesting to see is um, we're going to be doing these for another four weeks, I think, and look back and see what may have changed between now and now. <laughs> Just a few weeks ago, when we were screening patients coming in the cancer center, we were asking if they'd had any contact with someone in any of the high-risk uh, countries and not screening them, even if they had symptoms, if they hadn't had any exposure like that. And now, of course, most of the spread is community spread, and we're screening based on symptoms and doing thermal scans, but there's emerging evidence that you know a large number of people may be shedding virus even before they develop symptoms. So I'm, uh, I would bet that uh, you know, we hear from the CDC, they're considering recommending masks. I think the main reason they haven't done that so far is just the concern that we may run out of masks uh, if everyone wears them all the time. Not so much that they don't, you know, there's probably no real harm to wearing a mask all the time. Um, and it might, it might prevent uh, asymptomatic spread. And when we're wearing masks, when we see patients, you know, we're really protecting them. Uh, if we were, we're doing that, we're not so much protecting ourselves. So I, I'm very curious to see how this, uh, how this changes over the next few weeks. But I, I also think it's an interesting point how the it is hard to realize when you touch your face routinely just mm -hmm. in the course of daily business. And when you're wearing a mask that is a deterrent or at least raises your awareness quite a bit about that. So to the extent that it reduces the risk of anyone's transmission just by changing your behavior, uh, that can be a secondary benefit. I'll tell you, when I wear a mask, I'm constantly having to adjust it to keep it from like steaming up my glasses. So I'm not That's sure true it's too. more effective than that. <laughs> you know, it's also changed the layout, the physical layout of, of our waiting rooms and of our infusion centers. And this is something mm -hmm. also mentioned in the guidelines by ASCO that this physical distancing is also true when we're in waiting rooms, our infusion centers, we're really using every other chair, we're spacing things out just to try to maintain that distance and, and maximize safety. And what are you guys doing with physical exams? Because we've actually, in many cases, stopped doing physical exams. If the patient's stable, they feel fine, we have a scan. Um, there's not a whole lot of extra merit for me listening to their heart with my stethoscope. Uh, and I've, I've actually stopped doing a lot of hands-on touching of the patients unless it's they have some sort of kind of symptom that I would need to, to do that. You know. I, I think that uh, I think that it it is one of the many many things that we now step back to do or to think about like what am I what is the pretest probability of this changing anything because it's pretty unusual we're going to uh, find something that's going to change practice or we're going to feel a spleen I mean most of the time particularly because a lot we often will do this really as a ritual very frequently. And right now I'm just realizing that, you know, I did this two or three weeks ago uh, and I have another scan. There's not, there's not really in a gratuitous repeating exam. And so I, I think that it's, I think it makes sense to evolve toward your kind of practice of what are we hoping to get from this? I would do it if there's anything suspicious, if there's somebody who, you know, has, a new symptom uh, or you know, some rash to evaluate, et cetera. But, but you know, just like doing telehealth and figuring we can get out a, a lot of health visits uh, without being able to palpate this 
or, or whatever else, um, you know, we can visually inspect uh, enlarging nodes sometimes between, you know, the, just visualizing uh, in, an, uh, in a limited exam or, or obviously potentially doing scans. Uh, but I think it's a great point that that's one of the many things we're pulling back. I think we do this a little more ritualistically than because the high value in it. Thank you. Those are some great points. Uh, let's move on to molecular testing. So, Dr. Argawal, are you experiencing delays in results? And and while we're at it, you know, how is this pandemic really impacting clinical trial and moment as well for new patients? Yeah. So, you know, I think um, this. Uh, pandemic is affecting all um, stages of uh, cancer care for our lung cancer patients, not just molecular testing, uh, but just even initial diagnosis. Uh, you know, uh, back in the day, we used to be able to go to our surgeon and sort of tell them, can you just wedge this piece out for me so that I can get ample tissue? Or what do you think about going in again and, you know, doing a bronch and getting us adequate samples uh, for uh, gene sequencing. And we just don't have the luxury anymore uh, to, to go and ask our surgeons or our pulmonologists and say, can we do these procedures? Um, we are all continuing to see new patients with lung cancer that need these tests. And we all know um, that molecular testing is so important for our patients with non-small cell lung cancer. Um, I literally just had a patient this week where um, you know, I didn't know if the sample was adequate or not. And you know, I think it's much to be emphasized about um, using plasma as much as we can now to, to find patients that may benefit from targeted therapies. Um, there are certainly, um, uh, uh, there are certainly home phlebotomy services that are available that will go out uh, to our patients' houses, even though we're not physically seeing them, and um, get these two tubes of blood uh, shipped out so that we can analyze their molecular sample. Um, and I think we should start using these services. They're available. They're easy to use. They're relatively non-invasive. They're not going to strain the health system. Um, you know, all of us have to be cognizant about our requests for invasive proce procedures at this point in time. And, you know, as um, Stephen mentioned at the last webinar, you know, if there's a patient um, where, you know, even if we don't have a tissue biopsy, if we have a radiographic appearance of a lung cancer and we send plasma and we find any GFR mutation, we, in this day and age, I think we should treat, I completely agree with Stephen, um, that we should be using, um, you know, our best judgment and all the tools that we have available to, uh, in a non-invasive fashion. Um, also, I think, you know, when new patients come in, um, my practice had been to always offer clinical trials and really talk about, you know, standard of care as well as what clinical trials there may be. And we just don't have the luxury to be able to have that elaborate of a discussion about clinical trials. A lot has been affected uh, during this pandemic. Uh, within our portfolio, we have really had to um, you know, prioritize which clinical trials we can feasibly run, which ones we can't. Unfortunately, we're not running um, the majority of our phase one trials right now. Um, and we are deciding to run some trials uh, which we know um, have a clear benefit, drugs that have shown uh, significant efficacy in, you know, smaller studies. We are continuing to run those. Uh, but then there are in-house investigator-initiated studies that require biopsies, right, or that require uh, processing from um, lab personnel that just aren't there. And, you know, unfortunately, those are on hold. In fact, our university is having a town hall meeting to discuss academic accomplishments, right, and what's going to happen with um, the promotion, uh, you know, timelines for faculty, because, it's affecting research in a big way and not just clinical trials, but, you know, think about lab-based research where people have to vacate labs and, you know, basically decant buildings. Um, 
and it's been a challenge. So I think universities are recognizing this, universities are offering probationary periods. So, you know, it's being affected overall, but I think coming back to the uh, patients and the lung cancer uh, discussion, I think it's imperative for us to continue to use as many tools as we have um, in our arsenal. When we, and I mean, all of us on the line are very experienced clinical trialists. And I think we truly believe that in many cases, a clinical trial is the best therapeutic option for a patient and for the field. But with each trial enrollment, there's a big impact, right? I mean, a clinical trial will often involve extra visits uh, for extra blood tests, for extra procedures, extra assessments. Uh, those visits are going to increase the exposure for the patient. And that carries on to the patient's family. For our staff, for the lab technicians, for the nurses. And as we lead our units, we're responsible for minimizing exposure for everyone involved. And, and each trial really, uh, you know, we have to put a lot of thought into to whether or not it, it is worth the risk. And we have to look at that risk benefit equation very differently today. Yeah. And no, go ahead, Dean. Oh, I was just gonna say, I, I completely agree. Uh, we, for one thing, we've pretty much stopped doing purely translational, you know, blood draws and things for, for patients. Um, for our complex trials that require frequent visits, you know, day, day eight, you know, day 14, coming in just for assessments and blood draws, you know, those trials are not high priorities right now. But at the same time, I think we do have to continue to offer trials that are um, for uh, patients that may not have other options or that really potentially represent a much better option than what their other options might be. And so we, we're still enrolling to trials, but we're um, uh, there's guidances out from the FDA, there's guidances from a lot of the companies and most recently from the cooperative groups saying that, you know, really clinical care is the priority. And if the patient has to get a scan at their local hospital so that they don't have to come into town, if they have to skip uh, some sort of a, a visit or a blood draw because it's just not safe, then generally, you know, you have to document that and the reason why, but I think there's going to be a lot more flexibility about skipping those things. Um, in the current environment. Which I think also would, is a, a value in, in one of the many steps of pulling back and asking, is this truly necessary? Or, and, and is this potentially uh, to the detriment of, of, uh, of folks? Um, one, of the, one of the other issues that I would, uh, would point out is that uh, patients who, uh, Maybe choosing between uh, between uh, a protocol now and pursuing it after some standard option may need to uh, it, it, you may want to have that be part of the decision making process with the idea that these trials that are open now and are projected to potentially be open for months may not be available. Uh, if future due to sponsored and so you want to get your chance with with an agent even if you might not pursue it ahead standard of care normally uh it's more of a bird in the hand and, and i've had a case today of somebody who we really are prioritizing uh, a trial option just while the getting is good knowing that that may close unpredictably in the future Those are some great points, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to move on to treatment modifications. We discussed a lot about uh, this last week in our webinar, but um, let's talk a little bit more about delays in treatment. So Dr. Liu, what have you been doing? You know, I, I don't think that lends itself well to sort of a flow chart or, or concrete guidelines. It has to be individualized. And uh, you know, we're not waiting out a hurricane for the next week or two. There's not really a clear end in sight. Uh, and you know, while we have projections, those are changing very rapidly, uh, and it's going to be different for regions. So if I say there's a, a little bit of risk with surgery, I should delay a you know potentially life-saving treatment for a month. Am I sure that things are going to be better in a month, or are they going to be worse? And if I'm in a region where the resources are ample, um, is it best to do my surgery now, uh, you know, rather than wait until we hit peak? Uh, infection and where resources are more limited. So you really have to take into context the current state in your region and the resources that, that are available. Uh, so uh, it doesn't lend itself well to universal guidelines, but I think each case needs to be individualized. And there needs to be open discussions 
with the patient and their provider. The whole goal here is to minimize risk. And you know, cancer treatment is not an elective procedure. Uh, cancer is going to move forward with, whether COVID is there or not. And so if there is a clearly superior treatment, uh, we need to offer that. And delays, we know in oncology, delays are costly. So we need to do everything we can to, to minimize that. It's just a matter of balancing the risk of exposure. And every decision we make is balancing the potential risks with the potential benefits, exposure to COVID and the frequency of visits now just has to factor into that. Yeah, and I would add that, uh, you know, as we are seeing more projections and we are seeing, um, you know, area-wide uh, diversity and, you know, how distributions are falling. For example, in the Philadelphia area, we're expecting now um, our peak to occur uh, mid-May or early to mid-May. And, you know, this is very different as compared to what our projections were last week or two weeks ago. So two weeks ago, I was telling my patients, let's just, you know, hold off for two weeks and maybe we'll bring you in for chemotherapy when things are settled. Uh, but now if I look at our uh, peak uh, to be six weeks away, you know, is it better to bring some patients in and give and treat them? And perhaps think about, you know, skipping some of the infusions that are four or six weeks down the line. So I think we are really making these decisions based on projections, based on, you know, real life, you know, minute by minute data as they're coming in. And it, again, it has to be very individualized in terms of which patients can truly stand a delay because this is not a one week, two week, three week situation. I think we are in this for the long haul and uh, potentially into the summer. No, that's a great point. I, um, I have patients who are calling saying, boy, should I just skip this one and come in next month instead? And um, and I'm actually looking at these graphs of when we think our surge might happen, and it could be anywhere from two weeks to six weeks. And so now, you know, if I can delay someone and just skip a scan entirely and see them in three months, I think that's a great option. But uh, if if they just want to delay it a few weeks, I, you know, I think it's better to come in and get it done now so that we can um, get their treatment and then get their maybe get a scan a little bit early now. And then that way, if it's good, we can push them off, hopefully beyond this current riskiest period. You know, we have to factor the schedule of the treatments too. And where in the past, I might've sort of favored using a, a weekly regimen like NAB paclitaxel. Now, all of a sudden, you know, mm -hmm. uh, regular paclitaxel looks a lot more appealing to me because it's every three weeks. We look mm -hmm. at the recent approval for small cell maintenance, Dervalimab every four weeks, much more appealing. The FDA's approval last year of the four week atezolizumab, I think is, is very relevant now. The problem is really applying those to other situations. And so one setting in the stage three where we're using chemo radiation in the year of dervalimab every two weeks, can I apply the every four week regimen of dervalimab used in small cell to, to the non-small cell regimen? But here we get into a little trouble with, with maybe downstream consequences. If you've got a commercial insurance, we can do prior authorization, explain the rationale. And I like to believe that those tools, the rational being at the other end, uh, makes a great case for that. But for our patients who are covered by Medicare, for example, there is no prior authorization process. And so at the end of this, um, you know, when, when hopefully this does end, they may end up with, with a fairly large bill and the economic impact of everything we haven't even spoke to, but, but these are, are big numbers. So uh, at some cases where, where I might not get that higher dose approved at longer intervals, I may choose to just space things out a bit um, at, the, at the lower dose. And it's, it's a compromise. And again, it's going to be dictated by the specific situation. And I look at someone differently if they're on month 10 versus month one. Uh, but these have to be very individualized and open discussions. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Liu and, and everyone else on the panel. Um, and I believe that there is a case that you would like to discuss as well. So Dr. Pennell, would you like to get into that? Sure. Uh, let's see. You know, while, while Nate's bringing that up, uh, I just want to, you know, Charlie, you brought up a great point in terms of all the, the basic science research. And we've made so many advances in the past 10 years. And the impact of COVID on the preclinical work is something we won't fully appreciate till years down the line. But all of the work on cell lines, on xenographs, all of the non-therapeutic work, you know, we've really shut down those labs to, to minimize exposure. And we have some minimal personnel maintaining animal models, but 
there will be some impact on, on the face of lung cancer research that we won't see until till much further down. Yeah, and at the same time, it's it's really, it warms my heart to see all of the unified efforts that are going on nationally and internationally uh, to bring therapies to the forefront for uh, COVID-19. Um, you know, we're seeing uh, clinical trials um, emerge. Uh, you know, there are um, collaborations occurring uh, within departments, within divisions that we had not seen before and, you know, really accelerated efforts, um, which we really need also. So I think something good is coming out of this and within every problem lies an opportunity. So I think, you know, the opportunity for unified science um, is occurring right Right now. Uh, on a broader sense, just the removal of bureaucratic uh, barriers has been astonishing. How fast the FDA is approving things, how fast our IRB is approving protocols. I mean, we have trials for outpatient and ICU uh, COVID patients. I mean, they just were created a week or two ago, and now they're actually open and enrolling. And this is just astonishing how fast things can move when it really matters. And I hope people remember that when this is done, that it's not necessary for it to be six or nine months to get a trial open if you can get it open in, uh, in 14 days. Um, okay, so uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about a case because this is actually, uh, I've on several occasions just in the last few weeks, uh, encountered similar situations to this. So this is a, um, if you can see the slide here, a uh, t very typical seven-year-old patient with advanced non-small cell lung cancer who progressed after first-line chemotherapy and is now being treated with second-line uh, tezolizumab, which is the anti pd one antibody. Um, and uh, after several cycles, uh, the patient's now calling up and is presenting with a fever uh, with a worsening dry cough uh, getting more short of breath, and then is hypoxic on exam. Um, so this is um, an incredibly common kind of picture that lung cancer doctors are really used to dealing with. So we're used to seeing uh, patients with um, shortness of breath, with cough. I mean, it could be so many different things. We're, it could be their cancer getting worse. It could be um, they could have a PE. They could have a post-obstructive pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia. Obviously, we're uh, given the topic of the, the webcast today, this could be uh, COVID or even influenza. Um, and then, of course, the one thing that all of us have been now drilled into our heads, I would say every house staff, medicine house staff, certainly, that I work with, before I even meet them, is already prepped to be looking out for immune-related pneumonitis. And um, the question in our patients is, how do you differentiate these? So... Um, I would say, you know, the first thing to do is, is get a good history. Obviously, if this is something that's been a chronic problem and is just getting mildly worse, uh, might be a disease process um, from their cancer. Um, if, uh, uh, but, but probably the, uh, and then the presence of a fever, I think, is very suggestive of an infection. So our, our patients with um, pneumonitis from immune uh, checkpoint inhibitors typically do not have uh, high fevers accompanying this, much more typical with infection, but you can see that. Um, and so one of the first things uh, that helps differentiate these would be to get some imaging. Um, and I think if we go to the next slide, so this is a, a, a patient who had this exact scenario, was actually very ill, and um, had these sort of diffuse ground glass uh, opacities throughout the lungs, some areas of consolidation, and this is a picture which, so first of all, you can, you can rule out disease progression. So this clearly is not rapid disease progression that's causing this. Uh, it's not a PE, uh, but it's not all that helpful at distinguishing between an infection such as an atypical pneumonia or a viral pneumonia or immune um, uh, pneumonitis. So we know that pneumonitis related to immune checkpoint inhibitors occurs probably in about three to 4% of people who get drugs like atezolizumab. Uh, often is asymptomatic, but um, uh, you know when it is symptomatic and uh, patients uh, need to be hospitalized, it's serious and you need to figure it out and treat it quickly. And the reason it's so important to differentiate is that the treatments are entirely different. For pneumonitis, the treatment is high-dose steroids, whereas if it's uh, a viral pneumonia, then really supportive care or perhaps enrollment in one of these treatment trials would be the best way to go. So um, 
So looking at this scan, uh, I'm gonna throw it out to the rest of our panel. What, what, do you, what would you, how would you approach this person admitted to your service? I, well, I, I think that you're exactly right that one of the real challenges, just like for years we've been trying to teach, uh, teach folks not to reflexively give antibiotics to patients who are on or go on to immunotherapy. Now we want to say that about students too, that, that we don't just snap their fingers and give uh, steroids when it could be a, a harmful thing. I would be really interested in, besides to find out how soon we could possibly get the result of the, the testing done, is look at whether there's any known exposures of other people as a clue. I would be probably inclined to initiate any uh, specific treatment, uh, no, most notably it's in this setting, uh, based on the risk of doing unintended harm in the very significant chance that this is COVID-19 and not, uh, and not um, autoimmune pneumonitis. So I, I, think, I, I think those would be the considerations for me to the extent that you can get any clue about the pretest probability that, you know, is this in a place where COVID, where coronavirus is present or whether this is uh, somebody who has had any known contacts or known. I mean, the CT could be either, right? This is a really tough case because the stakes are really high. And when we think of immune-related pneumonitis, this is potentially a fatal complication. And six months ago, I think all of us would agree you give steroids and you sort it out later because early adoption of, of steroids really leads to better outcomes for an immune-mediated pneumonitis. But in the setting of a COVID infection, uh, we believe that steroids might decrease viral clearance and suppressing that immune response might be detrimental. Uh, so when you're faced with very different management, the, the best answer is to try to get a rapid uh, COVID test and, and some of the new commercial tests that have a very quick turnaround. This is what it's made for, to help us make these right decisions. If, if we don't have that, if we're in a place where it's a long turnaround, I, I think that fever is not something I usually see with immune-mediated pneumonitis. And so I, so I think that points me more towards, towards infection and down that route but these are gonna to be tough calls in the heat of battle. Yeah, I would add that, um, you know, I think the, the one thing about this case that leads me towards um, testing is probably fever. I think all of us in our clinics see sort of this mild cough and, um, you know, sometimes there's increased oxygen requirement just based on, you know, immune infiltrates or immune related pneumonitis. But I think um, the fevers are what would push me to, test. And I think the testing pattern will be dictated by which area of the country we're in. Um, but we are aggressively testing for patients uh, that are presenting with these symptoms. And, you know, that brings up the question of um, where are these tests being performed? Uh, I mean, are we sending these kinds of patients to the ED? Or are we sent, putting in, a, in an order and sending a patient like this to uh, to the drive-through uh, testing site, um, I think you know the again the practices will be different based upon which region we are talking about. Um, if I were to send this kind of a patient to my emergency room, um, this patient would be considered a PUI or a person under investigation and would be actually admitted to a PUI rule out or a you know COVID nineteen rule out service and only after they test negative, uh, would then their management be really guided by, um, let's say the oncology house staff or the oncology attendings. Um, I had a patient who presented with uh, diarrhea yesterday. Uh, she has been on immune therapy and um, just all of a sudden started having uh, worsening diarrhea with some low grade fever. And, you know, while cough and, you know, respiratory symptoms are much more likely to happen with the coronavirus, we have also sort Certainly, seen issues with diarrhea come up, and um, you know, given the sig severity of her symptoms, I unfortunately had to send her to the ED, and you know, she was ruled out for COVID. And again, you know, where the test is sent out from uh, determines the speed of or the or the turnaround. So we have some in-house tests that are much more uh, rapid. Um, you know, in, in the order of even 45 minutes now um, that, that come back uh, 
but those need approval uh, by our infectious disease team uh, so that we are not utilizing those tests um, inaccurately and really are using them judiciously. So I, I do think that there'll be regional differences in this, uh, but certainly I think COVID is on everyone's mind. And I think patients should be judiciously ruled out if they present with these mixed symptoms. But I think one of the other things we need to factor in is that uh, you know, we do have a potentially very effective therapy in the in the uh, steroids for immune-mediated pneumonitis. If I had a patient who we just didn't know what was happening, and despite best efforts and everything we might be able to do for COVID-19, was on event and doing worse, I, I don't. I think that it would be a shame to um, not try steroids just on that ability. I mean, we just don't have any know of that that works reliably for COVID-19 as the way that steroids have the purpose of working or, or other interventions for immune-mediated illness. I would just hope that it becomes in the coming weeks less and less likely that we'd have kind of scan uh, and patient in front of us without being able to get an answer and just be doing get for that matter, it'd be really wonderful to have a reliable intervention for this that uh, things around uh, and not just rely on trials and bits of what to do. Yeah, I think that's a great discussion. This is, uh, the truth is you can't tell from purely from the symptoms and from the scan you know, what the etiology of this is. This could definitely be either. Um, I think I agree that the fevers are certainly suggestive of an infection, but um, the key here is to be able to test and actually identify what's wrong. And, and if you are in a situation where you're in a place where you either can't get the test or your test is only a send out that's gonna take, you know, four days to get back, then you're just gonna have to use your clinical judgment. And if the patient is decompensating, um, you know, you're, you're probably gonna have to bite the bullet and try steroids. Um, uh, simply because it's such a it's such a potentially reversible cause and uh, can rapidly get worse if the patients are decompensating with pneumonitis. Can I ask the my colleagues uh, maybe a little twist on this case? What if this was a patient receiving a, a TKI? Um, uh, you know, uh, similar types of pictures, um, but let's say we knew it was COVID nineteen positive. Would you hold the TKI in this patient? Mm -hmm. Anyone? <laughs> yeah, I, I actually, you know, it depends again. I think it's a very individualized um, um, patient decision. If there's a patient who has been very stable on their TKI and has been on it for a few years, I think that that discussion may be different. But the as compared to somebody who's just recently started a TKI. But I think the honest fact is we don't know the interaction of TKIs and pneumonitis and, and COVID-19 at this point in time to make a generalized um, discussion. So I don't have a clear answer. I, I, I really think um, would depend on the patient. I do think it's not that likely that if you held it, that things would deteriorate remarkably quickly over days. So I think that there's little risk of pausing to take a step back and see how things go. Mm -hmm. As, as Charu said, and I think many of us are thinking, even though we don't know the harmful interaction, but the operative phrase is we don't know. I mean, we, we not, it's, it's not been described before. I wouldn't presume it, but I think there's little to lose by holding it for 48 or 72 hours and reevaluating not likely that the patient is going to, you know, deteriorate in front of our eyes from, uh, from a lack of TKI when we would routinely hold it for other toxicities we know about. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's right. I mean, if you're just going to hold it for a few days, although if it is COVID pneumonia, then the patient's not necessarily going to be all that much better in a few days. Um, you know, you might be talking about if you want to hold until they get better, it could be weeks before you could restart. And then it's a little more relevant to think about what their disease burden is. You know, someone who's on Tigriso because they've got leptomeningeal disease and, you know, uh, I'm not sure if I necessarily feel comfortable holding that, um, especially if I had a, a, another etiology. But 
you know, the, there was just a really nice uh, thing. Um, uh, Dr. Bob Doble just uh, was talking about a scenario like this and, and, uh, and had kind of an informal poll. And it was, it was a pretty, I think, uh, semi-contentious split of people who wanted to hold versus people who um, would continue that. Great, thank you. And and honestly, thank you so much for all of you to um, share all this insight tonight. Obviously there's a lot more that can still be discussed, um, but it is time that we open up the question and answer portion of this webinar. So just as a reminder to our listeners and viewers, if you go to the ask question and answer box on the right corner of your screen, you can type your question directly in the space that is in the box and then hit submit. So uh, we do have a nice, a uh, handful of questions to go through, so we'll get through as many as we can. Um, so one of the first questions we have here is, as more surgeries are being delayed, have you started to perform more liquid biopsy testing in place of tissue testing for tumor profiling? Well, I think a lot of us on this call were, were using a lot of liquid biopsy already, and so that, that maybe hasn't changed too much, but I do think that you know, if you're at a hard hit area, you know, bronchoscopy may just not be an option. There just may not be bronch suites. There may not be pulmonologists and intensivists and, and resources are being diverted appropriately so, but they're being diverted to sort of deal with COVID infections. And so a lot of those things simply aren't possible. We're pursuing diagnostic biopsies as of right now at our institution, uh, but we are leaning heavily on liquid biopsy. Yeah, and I think it, uh, I don't think that uh, I would feel generally comfortable using a liquid biopsy um, you know, for diagnosis. I think you still need the tissue diagnosis because, you know, at least in our part of the world, there's a lot of small cell, a lot of squamous cell. Uh, it's not, you're not going to get a lot of necessarily useful information from a liquid biopsy purely on that. But in the setting where you don't have enough material to do molecular testing for a non-squamous, non-small cell, you know, I think it's a no-brainer. I mean, as you said, there's going to be a lot of pulmonologists right now who are going to be operating ICUs and not available to do bronchoscopies. Uh, surgeons are not going to be, be able to do wedges or, or mediastinoscopies to get tissue. And, um, and commonly, people don't have enough material to get biomarker testing. So I think uh, this is an ideal situation for broad uh, testing, specifically for biomarkers, but not necessarily for tissue diagnosis. Great. Okay. Um, the next one is kind of a, a piggyback off of the liquid biopsy. And Dr. Argawal, I know you spoke about um, phlebotomy services earlier. Uh, this question is for patients who will benefit from use of liquid biopsy in your guidance and targeted therapy selection and advanced non-small cell lung cancer, what recommendations can each of you provide for mobile phlebotomy services to ensure your patients will receive safe blood draws? Yeah, so I, I think we talked about some of this uh, before. I think it would be uh, really nice to have some kind of screening questionnaire before the phlebotomy service goes to the patient's house and, you know, sort of ensuring that they're not having symptoms um, and, you know, some kind of screening for even the nurses so that they're not running a temperature, for example, or having some symptoms before, um, you know, they go to a patient's house. Uh, and also, uh, you know, something to be said about, you uh, using masks. Uh, we're not talking about N95s, but, you know, we are talking about using surgical masks and of course, you know, sterile precautions when it comes to, um, and, you know, safe precautions when it comes to drawing blood as usual. I think this is a, a great point. And, and when we talk about using outside resources, avoiding people coming to the hospital, in all cases, we're not hundred percent sure that it's lower risk. You know, we, we would think that a CT scanner, for example, at an outside community center, would that be safer than the CT scanner in my hospital where I know that patients with COVID are, are getting CT scans there and, and it would seem that it's safer, but at the same time, I know that when a COVID positive patient has a CT scan, we have a one hour decontamination um, uh, protocol afterwards. I know there's a deep thorough clean. Do I know that's happening in the community where maybe there's asymptomatic shed? And, and I think the same goes true with, with phlebotomy. So if mobile phlebotomy services are out there communicating the steps they're taking to minimize that risk using PPE, uh, blood itself doesn't seem to transmit virus. This is based on the Nature paper released today. Blood and urine don't seem to sort of contain virus. And even stool, while it does have RNA, doesn't seem to be infectious virus. It's primarily the respiratory droplets as far as we can tell. But taking every effort to minimize the risks and minimize that exposure. Certainly if there was a whole team of mobile phlebotomists, I think that defeats the purpose. You know, mm -hmm. a single person, 
wearing a mask, taking the right precautions, uh, using gloves, I think and minimizing risk at every interaction. No, I think this is highly relevant. I actually had a patient uh, recently who was called by the health department that a visiting nurse um, that, that visited uh, the patient um, had tested positive. And so, you know, this actually hit home relatively recently. And so it's definitely something we need to think about. Nothing more that, yeah. Uh, so another question that came in, um, imaging screens help catch lung cancers early, but given resource constraints, are screenings still being performed at your centers? No, nope. yeah, I would say this is not happening and I'm not sure it should. Again, we, we, every decision we make is a, is a balance of risk and benefit and COVID-19 or coronavirus exposure is changing the equation for everything, including coming in for routine visits. But also, you know, we have enough problems that we, right now, uh, the trouble is finding us more than we going to look for trouble. So I think when the, the pretest probability is low and the, the risk of just coming in for scans and using resources at a time that, uh, that everything is, is being challenged in different ways, uh, we need to recognize that every calculation we've made was presuming there is pandemic going on at the time. And that calculation has to factor in systemic resources too. We're all drawing from the same pool. So that is, you know, a CT tech, that is someone at the waiting room, that is use of the machine, that is use of the radiologist. And, you know, reading these screening CT scans is maybe going to delay them from reading other CT scans. At the time, I think we have to factor in the resources just for our system. And I think right now is not the time for CT screening. I'm a very strong believer in, in the program, but just not, not in this climate. Thank you. Um, this is actually a um, kind of a payers question. So are you finding payers to be more flexible with prior authorizations? Unfortunately, um, not. And, you know, I think all of us are uh, chuckling a little bit because, you know, that's probably one area that could be improved significantly. You know, we've made a lot of improvements in terms of using telehealth visits and mobilizing our IRBs and, you know, getting clinical trials up and running quickly. But unfortunately, um, you know, there are lots of standard of care options uh, where many of us are getting called on to do prior odds for, which is uh, surprising, you know, in, in, in the midst of a pandemic that there are prior authorization calls for standard of care and guideline directed um, treatment regimens. So I, I think it'll be great if, you know, uh, those could be taken away, but those really um, are the bane of our existence and lead to burnout. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I think, is, oh, go ahead, Jack. I was just going to say that, uh, you know, following a Twitter uh, conversation, I think uh, a colleague of ours, Suresh Ramalingam, had commented on and that uh, it seems that these kind of peer to peer requirements have, if anything, escalated in this climate where we can ill afford to waste this time uh, for somebody to deign to allow us to give standard of care treatment. I, yeah, I'm um, uh, hopefully not going to get in trouble on this webcast, but, uh, you know, I think one of the big goals of all of these peer-to-peer -peer, uh, denials is that they hope that the physician will, will drop it and not do it so that they don't end up having to cover it. And uh, if anything, now when people are more stressed, uh, they may be even less likely and have less time to do it. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if insurers are, uh, know that and are taking advantage of it. I mean, I, I can attest that they have not stopped, that I'm still doing prior authorizations. And a lot of times to minimize efforts, we're trying to dispense three month supplies and we're running a, a lot of pushback for that. But to give CMS credit, you know, by, by authorizing telehealth visits and then earlier this week, authorizing telephone visits where video capabilities aren't, aren't available to all of, our, all of our patients where maybe the technology or the cost isn't there, using telephone visits and sort of removing that barrier, I think was, uh, you know, there's a lot of insight, and I think that we got to give them credit for that. I agree. I think that, you know, though I'm I'm a fan of telemedicine, I think it's going to be a, a great tool that was really born out of 
of this unfortunate setting, but will have lasting benefit. It's not the right tool for every job or for every patient. There are folks for whom a, a new technology is pretty daunting or the platform isn't that intuitive. And just about everyone's pretty adept with using a phone and that is still an appropriate tool. I think it's, it's great if we can reevaluate some of our practices being based on reimbursement-based medicine rather than uh, you know, what's best for the patient's situation. And if we can be, uh, you know, be able to do something that's simpler for the patient, very doable for us, doesn't require them to, uh, you know, to uh, expand their, their, um, their uh, skill set. Uh, and can just use a phone for this. I think that's that's really wonderful. I hope that also is uh, sustained and we can continue to individualize and prioritize which patients should be a live visit, a telemedicine video, video visit, and which one should be a telephone beyond uh, our time of isolation. I think the telephone visits and the telemedicine visits have just been a game changer. I mean, it, there's so many... Today, we were talking about um, a patient on a clinical trial who had visits, and then they were supposed to see so many different people on that visit, and we ended up getting, uh, getting it down to just the minimal interaction and doing uh, quality of life questionnaires over the telephone. Um, and it was, um, I, I think this is something that's gonna be so incredibly convenient for our patients that I hope that the emphasis and for, for CMS and perhaps other payers to continue to reimburse for doing more phone and telehealth. I hope that continues after the emergency is over. Thank you so much. Uh, another question we have is surrounding the th uh, thoughts on sensitivity of COVID tests. Uh, reports vary, but given fundamental differences in how to treat IO pneumonitis versus COVID, will you repeat tests before starting mm -hmm. steroids? Again, we're... I'm saying I don't know a lot more than, than even I usually do, but I, I think we don't really know the, the details of these tests. And there's so many tests out there, which is a great thing, but the false negative rate of 30% has been quoted a lot for these PCR-based assays. And we know from, from the Chinese data that NGS-based assays seem to be uh, a bit better in terms of sensitivity, but maybe a little bit slower in terms of turnaround. And I think that if our suspicion is there and we have a negative PCR test, we will repeat that test. Um, but can you afford to wait another week to get the results uh, before treating what may be a potential, uh, you know, life-threatening immune-mediated pneumonitis? You can't. And that's why we need more tests. We need better tests. We need faster tests. And that's going to solve it. All right, great. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, this actually goes back to the case-based uh, discussion that we had. So are ELISA-based tests useful for treatment decisions in a case like this? And what about false negative rates? So ELISA-based tests um, would be more antibody-based tests looking for, um, you know, are there antibodies to, to the virus once uh, a person has been infected? Um, I don't think there's much literature to use um, ELISA-based assays to guide treatment just yet. I think there would be a movement to try and use uh, sort of these ELISA-based uh, assays to screen healthcare workers who've developed quote-unquote immunity and can return to the healthcare workforce. But I, I doubt that right now we're using these to make um, decisions in the clinic uh, in terms of um, diagnosing uh, the disease. All right. Thank you so much. So that does appear to be all the time that we have now for questions. So again, I'd really just like to thank the faculty, Drs. West, Dr. Pennell, Dr. Liu, and uh, Dr. Argawal. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time out of your crazy schedule. I know it's been very, very busy for you lately um, to sit down with Ankai virtually and obviously discuss these very important discussion topics with our audience tonight. So and uh, thank you so much to our listeners. I hope you were able to gain a lot of valuable insight uh, into the clinical practice and how it's changing in oncology during this pandemic. Um, so again, we are making these webcasts a regularly occurring series. And I know there was a couple questions come in and coming in about whether we're going to archive them. And yes, you will be able to watch them again uh, after this webinar has ended.
And I do want to announce that for next week's program, we will have a very special edition. So um, Tony Mock, um, MD, who's a professor in the Department of Clinical Oncology at Chinese University of Hong Kong will be joining us. And he can actually also provide some international perspective on COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so continue to visit Enclave.com. You can sign up for our e-newsletters or follow us on social media on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook to get updates on when we'll be broadcasting more of these webinars. Um, you can see from the slide that our next one will be at 8 p.m. on Wednesday, April 8th. And um, for all of your oncology news, you can visit Enclave.com where you will also be able to find our COVID-19 Resource Center. So that concludes this evening's webcast, everybody. Thank you so much and have a wonderful night. Hi, folks. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Thanks. Bye.